Hello, everyone. I'll just give everyone a couple seconds to trickle in here. started I think so uh hello everyone welcome to today's webinar building adaptation skills for indigenous communities this webinar is the final of seven that comprise the building adaptation skills for a changing climate webinar series um, we set this series to share experiences about how to build climate change adaptation skills my name is Kate Cameron and I will be the moderator for today's webinar I am an analyst at Natural Resources Canada in the climate change impacts and adaptation division before I continue, I would like to recognize that the Indigenous nations within the colonial borders of Canada have lived on this land and their respective territories for time immemorial. We recognize that their languages, cultures, and vibrant histories and continuous stewardship over the land enriches our communities and generations past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and acknowledge the relationship that the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis across Canada have with the land and that all Canadians live on and enjoy. Specifically, I would like to acknowledge that I'm currently situated on the traditional lands of the Mississauga, the Tionantadi, the Anishinaabewaki, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. We encourage you to share your own acknowledgement in the chat. The webinar today is made possible with funding support from Natural Resources Canada through Canada's Climate Change Adaptation Platform and the Building Regional Adaptation Capacity and Expertise Program, better known as BRACE. BRACE was a five-year program funded under the Pan-Canadian Framework that wrapped up in March 2022. It was funded, it funded 20 projects across several themes to increase capacity of organizations, professional communities, and businesses to adapt. We will add the link to the BRACE webpage in the chat where you can find the list of BRACE projects and some of the results. This webinar series features work done under BRACE and other related initiatives. The first two webinars of the series focused on building capacity for engineers and planners, well, the third one looked at upskilling the workforce through cross-sectoral training guided by competency frameworks and micro-credentials. The fourth webinar in the series focused on water management. The fifth focused on building capacity for various economic sectors throughout Canada. And the most recent webinar focused on building capacity for young professionals. The recordings for these past webinars are available on the Climate Risk Institute webpage. Today, you will be hearing from speakers who focus their efforts on building capacity for Indigenous communities. So just a few technical details before we start. Claire Sanders from the Climate Risk Institute is your technical support person for the webinar and will be available if you run into any audio or technical issues. Just click on the chat box and find her name in the drop down menu of participants to send her a direct message. Please note that your microphones have been automatically muted to avoid any audio distractions or feedback during the webinar. There is a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but that doesn't mean you have to hold your questions until then. Just please feel free to type out your questions during the presentation in the Q&A box and we'll address them after. The chat box is also available if you would like to submit comments. Please note that this webinar is only offered in English. We are recording the webinar today and we will be sending out a link to everyone who has registered along with a copy of the presentation slides. And now with all that said, on behalf of everyone joining us today, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our wonderful speakers, Dr. David Pearson, Roxanne Metlin, hopefully, <laughs> Laura Lines, Alvin Firstrider, Christy Allen, and Brett Hewson. So first up, we have a presentation from David Pearson and Roxanne Metlin. Uh, Dr. David Pearson is an Emeritus Professor of Natural Sciences and Science Communication at Laurentian University in Sudbury with 14 years of experience collaborating with Northern Ontario First Nations, during which time his small Up North on Climate team wrote 24 climate change vulnerability reports confidential to the communities and their knowledge holders. Roxanne Metlin, whose community is the Shaplow Creek First Nation, is a climate change specialist and GIS officer in the Meshkegawak Council. 
She participated in a workshop and booth about adaptation planning at the annual Assembly of First Nations Climate Gathering in Fredericton in September 2022. So David, I will pass it off to you. Well, thank you very much, Kate, for the uh, for the introduction, and it's good to see that my partner in crime on this uh, presentation, Roxanne, is uh, is also online. Uh, I'm speaking from the traditional territory of the Wanabate and the Tekmasheng First Nation, uh, just uh, west of, uh, of of Sudbury, and. Um, one of the words I want to stress in the title that you see here is sustainable, and I'm going to come back to that as I speak to you. The photo here, in case any of you are, are wondering about it, is of sunrise over Hudson Bay from the, uh, the second floor deck of the, um, uh, of the uh, inn in Fort Severn, uh, one of the most wonderful places I was able to visit uh, during, the, um, during the lead up to, to Brace. And on to the next slide, unless Roxanne would like to say hello. Roxanne, perhaps you would like to say hello. Yeah, I just want to say hello, uh, Roxanne uh, Metlin. You, I, the introduction already there from Chapel Creek First Nation. I'm glad to be here. And um, I was having a hard time there getting on with Zoom, but it turns out I needed my IT people there to upgrade me. So hopefully this doesn't happen again, because Dave knows I've been having trouble with Zoom for a while. It's, uh, it's great to see you, uh, Roxanne. And it was great to see this objective in the last edition of the National Adaptation Strategy that was released to the public um, in, uh, in the fall. Uh, it was good to see it because the objective here that I've circled in red is very much what we were working towards throughout our, uh, our, Brace, um, our Brace project and are, are looking forward to continuing to um, to, to work on uh, when the national adaptation strategy uh, becomes a, a reality. We're um, impatient to see the final, the final version. Um, and on the, uh, the next slide, you will see the geography that our BRACE project uh, covered. Uh, about 40% of Ontario, north of the Great Lakes, up to Hudson Bay, over to the Manitoba border, and as far as uh, the Quebec border and, and and James Bay. It, it was a lot of country and it included uh, five tribal councils that you see named here, as well as Grand Council Treaty 3, which is a, a combination of, um, of, of three tribal councils. Um, that, um, that scope of work uh, was uh, the, what, what we engaged in with BRACE. And as we worked through the BRACE project, we all agreed that we should call ourselves a partnership, an informal partnership, what we called a partnership of convenience, PICA, Partnership for Indigenous Climate Change Adaptation. So that's now what we, uh, what we call ourselves. The partnership has gone beyond collaboration to, um, to a, a little more collective recognition. And on to the next slide. You will see here uh, the invention of the 24 vulnerability reports that Kate mentioned in the introduction in which we learned how to braid Western science with indigenous knowledge. And um, we, uh, we did this with the support of what was then a Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation in Ontario. That ministry doesn't any longer exist, um, uh, but uh, while it did, we were able to do three years work between 2016 and 2018 uh, to, um, to write those vulnerability reports. Part of uh, what was important about that process that from which we have learned and carried through into the uh, to the brace work were the, the questions that were put into a questionnaire that was used in each of those 24 First Nations. Uh, and we didn't uh, administer the questionnaire. It was, um, it was conducted by a, a community member uh, who was paid for the work and uh, the people who answered that, uh, that questionnaire um, were also rewarded with, uh, with an honorarium. And part of what was important about the questions was the, the work that uh, Xavier and I did, which covered many hours in the, uh, the inn and the Yobmatong First Nation, um, writing questions that would prompt stories from people who, um, who were interviewed. And um, uh, we, uh, we learned very much uh, about, um, about how to engage with First Nation individuals during that, um, uh, during that, um, uh, that, that process of, of writing those vulnerability reports. 
Next slide, please. And part of what we learned too, which has been very valuable, was the extraordinary recall that community members had of details of events in the, in the past. And of course, those that we were uh, interested in were, were those that were connected with, um, with climate change, changes in, the, in weather patterns, changes in the severity of storms and, and, and flooding and events like that. And this is a sketch that uh, Xavier drew uh, in 2012, um, many years, 53 years after the event had happened when, when, he was, uh, when he was a boy. And stories and sketches have become very much the, uh, the tools of, um, of the, uh, that we've developed during the, uh, the BRACE project. So learning from, from Xavier was a very, very important step not only in the work that we were doing then, but in the subsequent work we've been able to do with BRACE, which is why I'm covering a little bit of history here. Uh, next slide, please. And, and when we, we put those, re, those vulnerability studies reports together, uh, the, um, the blending, the, bra the, the braiding of, of science and traditional knowledge was, um, uh, was reflected in these, uh, these spreadsheets that we put together, the, the climate change impact risk and ad adaptation planning matrix. And the next step in that work, and we wrote about 200 of these in those, um, those, uh, those reports, the next step with all of them would have been to engage with communities so that communities would discuss what we had um, documented and would come to decisions about what their adaptation priorities would uh, would be. Uh, we'd hope to continue that in BRACE, but then COVID came along uh, and we had to change our plans. Next slide, please. Part of what we also learned and which might seem uh, not so relevant to the business of, um, of, of discussing adaptation in Northern communities, was what you might call cultural effect. In fact, not just northern communities, but any indigenous community in Canada, was this cultural respect. Bernie Thomas um, showed me this um, mammoth tooth when, when I was up in Fort Seven on one of my visits. And, and part of what one realizes is that not only did the mammoths come across uh, Beringia, the, what is today the um, Bering Straits between uh, Alaska and Asia, but at the same time, the ancestors of the First Nations came across too. Between about 20,000 and 40,000 years ago, they discovered Turtle Island. And it's perhaps um, uh, worth a mention that uh, I understand that the Catholic Church today has in fact, um, whatever the word would be, rescinded perhaps the doctrine of discovery. Um, we realized that um, we were speaking to, to, the, um, to the first real adapters of, uh, of uh, Turtle Island when we were speaking with people like, um, people like Ernie and, and others in the communities that we, uh, we engaged. The extreme conditions that they adapted to on the, at the front of the, uh, the ice sheet uh, are uh, worth reflecting on when they say they've been adapting for, for millennia. Indeed they have and they, uh, the, um, the first adaptations were extreme. Next slide, please. But on to more uh, of, uh, of BRACE than, than uh, the uh, preliminaries and the lead up and the prior experience. This is our team. The, uh, the four of us at the top there are uh, at Laurentian University. Uh, Cassidy is a graduate of our science communication program and now teaching at uh, our local college. She's our graphics person and was very important in the, uh, the development of the tools that I'll speak to you about in a moment. The, um, the six members of the team below were supported with, um, with some race funding. They were part-time employees in their, their, uh, their councils. And, and one of the ways that we wanted the architecture of the project to support sustainability was to make sure that there was a person who, was, um, who would still be in place after the, the BRACE project was, was, uh, was over. And indeed, they all still are, even though the BRACE funding uh, terminated, uh, terminated a year ago, the climate change experience, the climate change um, discussions and knowledge that, um, that uh, took place during BRACE have stayed in those, those tribal councils. 
they uh, when, and we meet still every Wednesday we meet and we talk about uh, what's uh, what might be the news of climate change in uh, in in the uh, the communities of the um, uh, of the the climate change specialists uh, and you'll see Roxanne there on the left uh, and then the uh, the others uh, to the uh, to her to her right uh, and I can tell you that we're working with Megan now uh, in that um, that um, partnership of, of convenience, PICA, we're working with the Nukiwan Tribal Council to develop adaptations for, um, for, their, for their communities, part of this, this uh, partnership of, uh, of convenience. Next slide, please. The, um, the, the next step in working with communities requires tools that can be used in community discussions as communities consider the adaptations that um, will benefit their communities um, most. And part of what um, we found uh, from that prior experience that I spoke of was that story graphics or sketch graphics, but we like to call them story graphics, bring the, um, bring the consideration of climate change sort of down to the ground in a friendly way that um, is, um, is, is very appropriate for working with, with people who, uh, whose, whose learning comes from stories and from personal experience and from the, um, the experience that's passed down through, through generations. At the top of these graphics, you'll see there's a, there's a, a, a blade uh, that in, in which the impacts are, uh, uh, the climate change impacts are, are, are presented. And then below in the bubbles are uh, potential adaptations for, uh, for dealing with those, uh, those impacts. Next slide, please. And on the, on, on the front, you see this is the flooding, uh, the flooding story graphic. And on the back of the story, flooding story graphic, next slide, you'll see there's, um, there's information. And what I need you to imagine is that uh, you're in a community meeting People are sitting at tables. They each have uh, the, um, the graphic in front of them that is for the topic of the discussion uh, that, uh, that morning or that hour or that day. It could be wildfire, it might be food security, it, it might be um, infrastructure. There, there are eight of these, um, these themes. And uh, they're, um, they're discussing at the table and then uh, they're, they're speaking about the conclusions of the table to the whole to the whole group and working towards what their adaptation priorities are. These are triggers for discussion. They're trigger documents, triggers for community discussion. Next slide, please. And, and here's an example of, um, of, a, of a, a meeting of exactly that kind. It's, it's one that was brought together by, um, by Geneva Kajic, who is the uh, climate change specialist in Grand Council Treaty 3. And, and she uh, organized last May a, um, a meeting of, of youth, a climate change meeting of youth. You'll see those sorts of graphics that I just spoke about pinned on the, uh, on the wall. Uh, and alongside them are, um, are, are, are posted sheets that were written up by youth considering those particular uh, impacts in their community. Next slide, please. And here you see one young, uh, young girl, drawing what she sees as um, a climate change uh, issue, demanding adaptation in her community. And what she's done is she's drawn the homes that are on the floodplain of the river that flows through the, uh, through the community. Next slide, please. And, and here is that, um, that sketch being shown to all of the, the, uh, the youth in the room and, and they then, are able to, to comment on whether there's uh, something similar to that in their community. Uh, the, the outcome of this, um, uh, the outcomes, I should say, of, of this um, uh, youth, uh, youth climate meeting that, that Geneva put on were, were just excellent. And uh, next slide, please. And, and uh, into the, the last two or three slides here, part of what we've done with those tools is we've put them into uh, what we call an adaptation framework, a planning framework with five steps, five community meeting steps. Uh, you see the first one here setting the groundwork and the others are in the, uh, in the framework. So not only have we 
designed, co-designed, co-created those tools for use by communities, but also the framework within which they can be uh, they can be used. And next slide, please. And what we've also done is we've begun to create what we call this geo hub. And you can see the uh, the ecosystems and infrastructure and health and the various themes along the top. The first one that we've developed is wildfire. And this we see as a one stop shop, if you like, for uh, both the published as well as the uh, the uh, the community information about all of those um, uh, those uh, adaptation uh, challenges in uh, in northern communities. And next slide shows the what was mentioned in Roxanne's introduction, the the uh, AFN climate gathering in Fredericton, where um, a Roxanne uh, attended. You'll see her with her mask on in the bottom left corner. A photo, but also you'll see Bob Duffin, who was a, a member of the the um, the adaptation uh, panel, uh, the Brace panel, which um, sort of oversaw the project, meeting once every uh, every month. They're senior members in the tribal councils. Uh, Bob Duffin is, uh, I think, Roxanne's uh, director, and uh, we gave away uh, about eighty copies, eighty hard copies of all of the the uh, the tools that we uh, we developed. Um, and uh, uh, had uh, a, a very good reaction to them, I'm, I'm pleased to say. And finally, uh, and a, a slide on which Roxanne, uh, the next slide that Roxanne can, uh, can pick up on, uh, Roxanne has a post here on the, um, the, uh, the Facebook um, group, the closed Facebook group, so that we don't get people talking about their dogs, but we get people who are posting about uh, climate events in their, uh, in their communities. And you'll see Roxanne posted uh, here on April 11th at 12.29. It, it's, uh, Facebook is a, an excellent way of, of having people communicate with one another. Uh, Roxanne, you might want to pick up with your thoughts uh, at, this, uh, at this point. You'll need to turn your microphone on. Yeah, I just have that. Thankfully, there's a sign up there that reminds me of that. But anyway, um, no, I just wanted to say there that I know because um, I forgot to mention there too. I'm I'm actually working out of Timmins there, the the uh, traditional territory of the Metagami First Nation, and our Meshkigawak Tribal Council um, supports the First Nations there up the James Bay coast. So with that being said, this particular picture shows the um, the the river. Um, and uh, the uh, the thawing, I guess, the spring break up there is it what they call it there, and how hazardous it is um, annually, I guess, not only through for Moose Knee Moose Factory, but for other communities up the coast. There, there's they're always watching the water, they're always watching the uh, the ice and. A lot of it um, is cause for evacu evacuation for these communities to have to leave their homes um, for a period of up to a couple of months or a month at the least to um, to ensure their, their own safety there from these um, uh, uh, floodings. So um, basically, that's just like a reminder there, I guess, on that post there. Like, I mean, we're getting into a, a spring thaw there soon there. So we're probably going to be seeing some more of uh, this activity there and see um, um, but uh, you know, just an annual thing there. Like, why is it? Why is it just? Uh, why is it okay there to just continually um, bring these people from their communities there? And why isn't something more being done about the climate change and what's being done in in the the territory here? So basically, that's it. Shouldn't be an annual thing. It shouldn't be an annual concern because if it was happening in southern Ontario, it would be a whole totally different story. So. That's all I have to say on that particular topic. <laughs> Great. And and your experience as part of the um the the Brace project as a climate change specialist was was I hope a, a good one, Roxanne. It was an eye opener, and uh, I I learned a lot of things. Um, unfortunately, like David mentioned there, that it was it, it did like most of our meetings were 
um, done through the, the COVID because we weren't able to get to the communities to get their input. We were relying on each of the uh, members there from the, the tribal councils to have their input there and my colleagues who I wasn't able to see on a day-to-day -day basis again through COVID. And then we have these, uh, um, these pamphlets there that we weren't able to distribute or have community meetings with and, and bring to them, you know, like what we worked on for the past couple of years because you know like so so there's so many things there that that weren't able to happen because of it but these pamphlets was uh one great one great thing there that did, did come out of it and hopefully we can find a way to to use these um th this information and share it with the communities i was talking to to dave there this morning and i and for each tribal council, as far as I know, and I know it happens within my own tribal council, it's like it doesn't matter what department we work in, we're all linked to something happening within the climate change environment there. So we're all linked together there. And I just because I work here in GIS or I'm, or, or I'm a climate change specialist doesn't mean that it's not affecting somebody over in health. And, and then we're all working together to, you know, like to understand this more or to to share the information more so i think uh i think i, I think a program like this is beneficial and what i like to see is programs like this continuing there because it just doesn't stop after three years you know climate change it didn't it didn't just happen and you know just like covid just didn't finish it's still continuing so so is climate change great uh, thanks so much, Roxanne. Um, we've taken more time than we should. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thanks very much for, for being patient and tolerant. Thank you so much, David and Roxanne, for a great presentation. I'm just checking to make sure there's no technical questions coming up. I don't see any so far. So I will move on then to our next presenters, Laura Lyon and Alvin First Rider. So Laura Lyon is the pres president and CEO of the Resilience Institute. Laura holds a Master of Law with Distinction in Climate Change Law and Policy, a Master's Degree in Intercultural and International Communications, is a focal point of the UNFCCC Nairobi Work Program, and was most recently a National Rapporteur for the Climate Change Litigation Initiative. Alvin First Rider is an Environmental Technician with the Blood Tribe Land Management Environmental Protection Division. So I will give the floor to you, Laura and Alvin. Thanks, Kate. Super glad to be here today. I'm joining you from Treaty 7 territory, home of the Alberta um, Métis number three as well. And I'm in a community called Canmore, which is just outside of Banff National Park. So just for a little bit of context, and I, and I won't spend too much time on this because you can always refer to the slides later. We, um, the Resilience Institute is a national wide charity. We're based in, in Camor, but we're a distributed organization. So we literally have people everywhere across um, North America. Our mission is resilient futures and reducing risk to disasters. And how we have been um, interpreting that is primarily through adaptation and work with um, communities that are at a state of vulnerability. So we can just move on to the next slide. We'll get right into this. I'm really glad that uh, Elvin is able to join us today too. He's, he was one of the most engaged participants. So I'll whiz through this and then um, we'll hear from Elvin. And then if there's time, I'll just go over a little bit about how this has inspired some future work and collaborations. Um, so this is our story. This is our brace story. Everybody has a story um, of the brace journey and we were all impacted by different things, but I think all of us experienced COVID through it as well. Um, we were invited by the Alberta government to partner and this project was integral to the Indigenous Climate Change Observation Network in, in the government. Um, so together, we came together and we started off by asking, well, what expertise is missing from climate adaptation in Indigenous communities and approaches just in general? We all agreed that Indigenous communities in Alberta could benefit from increasing climate adaptation. Um, but that also <laughs> Canada could benefit from Indigenous ways of knowing when thinking about adaptation. 
We also agreed that climate change in itself is too big. So how do we bring this to a level that was within the scope of the time and budget? And we agreed that learning through themes is very helpful. So we said, Kate, okay, we're going to do a thematic approach to the BRACE project, but what theme? There's a lot of risks facing Indigenous communities and communities across Canada. And it's, I mean, primary flood, wildfire, and drought. Um, most of the communities that we have been collaborating with all had these as top priorities. Next slide, please. So based on our previous collaborations, um, we decided that wildfire was a common, we knew that it was a common threat, but what we liked about this theme is that it is destructive, but it's also rejuvenating. And the human relationship with fire is very different across cultures and epistemologies. So we felt that this theme in particular could invite dialogue about approaches to climate change that and especially at the time, really we're not getting a lot of attention. And in the last three or four years, I think there's been a lot of work in this area in Canada and we're quite happy to see that. So we had four communities across Alberta that partnered on this, Denny Dove First Nation, uh, Ghana, Blood Tribe, Samson Cree First Nation and uh, Bagani. Next slide, please. So we wanted to deepen understanding um, fire regimes across in, in the context of climate change, new insights on innovative practices, um, and build capacity for monitoring um, through learning. And we used, the method that we used was participatory videos. So next slide. So what is that participatory video? It is actually uh, quite a good tool for Indigenous communities. There's methodology behind it. And the idea is, is that you're training people to have tools to be able to capture their knowledge and share it in a way that can scale up action. Um, in this case, we were focusing on climate adaptation, but it can be used for a lot of different purposes. Um, the way we shared this was through video creations that were in community. Um, some of them just stayed in community. Some of the, the videos were not public, they, but they supported um, in community work. And some of them were made public through webinars um, and through an online story map, which you'd be able to see a link to. And during the process, it also enabled us to explore more what does ethical mean when we're knowledge sharing and working together. And this was an interesting space because we had a charity involved, we had government involved and different, different First Nations and each community is different. So there was a lot of dialogue and some good tools, I think, um, created from that. Next slide, please. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Alvin to talk a little bit more about um, his experience because he was hands-on in this. So over to you, Alvin. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, my Blackfoot name is uh, Holy Descent. I'm a member of uh, Ghana, our blood tribe, as, and I work as an environmental technician. Um, I'm a trained uh, Western scientist. I do have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. And, uh, when the initial application come out to uh, join this um, project, I jumped at the opportunity, um, not really knowing what participatory video was, but uh, as I learned more about it, I like I, I kind of grew a passion for it, passion for um, creating film, especially creating that narrative uh, that helped uh, promote uh, First Nations perspectives in uh, the environmental and conservation world. So yeah, uh, we initially started with, uh, we created videos on uh, Ghana's perspective on, or we, the Blackfoot Confederacy's perspective on climate change. So we started creating a video series um, and we, we, fin we finalized four videos in that series and it, uh, touched upon different topics, water, 
uh, directly climate change and how it's impacting our world, uh, wildlife, and uh, those those videos could be viewed um, on YouTube, and they they uh, they're very helpful in helping us um, show that narrative and showing what what type of impacts climate change is having in our region. And then year two of the the project, we were able to. Um, look into fire and how fire suppression has kind of created this perfect storm of catastrophic fires that are um, look um, that have impacted our, our ways of life. Um, prior to the year two of the project, there was the Kenal fire that happened in Waterton Lakes National Park. And it, it was really a, a a fire that changed um, the way fire behavior is looked at. It kind of created its own uh, fire behavior. It ran up and down the mountain and um, was just uh, had a huge fire severity. But in that, it uncovered a lot of our, our historical uh, artifacts and areas, which helped um, kind of reaffirm our narrative that we've always been in this region. And uh, so utilizing that as a foundation, um, we talked to our elders about how fire suppression has changed the land and um, how we could look at getting cultural burns back on the landscape. Um, and that, that was kind of difficult just because of uh, through colonization that support for fire has changed to where people look at fire as being a negative. But as we spark that memory in our elders um, and they, they started supporting us on getting fire back on the landscapes where we, we were able to reintroduce fire last spring and we're looking at ways to have a full um, program where we have a crew that will go out annually to restore that historical fire regime. So that's something that this project kind of initiated uh, was rematriating that connection with fire in uh, Ghana. So we're, we're looking at ways to uh, promote fire in a good way and also utilize Western science techniques to monitor um, both wildfire and cultural burns. Um, so yeah, that, that's just kind of my experience from uh, Brace and the ICON project and how it's helped our, promote our narrative as uh, it's said to be or, or the real people and how we've been able to restore that connection with fire and then help to build momentum and create these narratives for different environmental problems that are out on the landscape. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Alvin. I really appreciate uh, that you were able to join today and share as uh, your, your perspective. It's been a little while since we've been able to connect with everybody, but uh, thanks. Okay, uh, next yep. slide, please. Yeah. So I'm just gonna go over a little bit about uh, what thematic approaches have, have done for us in our learning from definitely from working through this BRACE project. And it has sparked also for us some other ways of engagement. And you'll be familiar with this in the adaptation cycle, of course, building awareness, gathering knowledge and community engagement. And we found that taking a thematic approach is quite powerful. So here are two um, stories of resilience and fire and ice, which uh, we, we themes around um, wildfire and maybe glacier melt, or as in the Wood Buffalo region and Fort McMurray, ice jams. And really it helps to strengthen um, and gather, gather, gather um, information um, and ready communities for the implementation of adaptation strategies. So next slide, and I'll quickly just go over some examples here. This is um, Stories of Resilience is bringing art and intellect together. So we will work with communities on something that 
is in the context of climate change, but it's really teasing out what is it that um, brings us together in strength and what, what defines our resilience, both personally and from a community or cultural perspective. And I really like what David said about triggers for discussions, because this is what is the result, is through the art and through the learning, it triggers discussions in communities about how can we be resilient? What are the strategies we need to do? And this can often be used in tandem when we're doing some of that deeper adaptation planning and needing to get community momentum. Okay, next slide, please. This is one example. I won't read through this with you, but um, working with uh, another, another community in the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Bagani First Nation, um, we did a stories of resilience with a diverse group of people. It included some elders and youth um, and just community members who didn't identify as either, but were really inspired by this. And they um, created their narrative about what it was about resilience and, and sustainability. And then we matched them with an indigenous artist who was inspired by their stories and did paintings for them. And this um, whole initiative is actually prompted an exhibition now at the Cave and Basin, which will be starting in May. And so that's the Cave and Basin Historic, um, National Historic Site in Banff, and it will be up for two years. Okay, next slide, please. Another one we did was up in Fort McMurray area in the Anzac area, which includes um, the 468 First Nation and also the Willow Lake Métis. They live very close to each other. And this, this one was looking at the relationship that Métis people had and the First Nation people had in the region with bison in the past. So what was was because there isn't there isn't buffalo other than um, Simcrude has some buffalo up there, but they don't actually have them in communities. So what would it look like to bring them back? And this is Erica Cree, who is the youth, youth project coordinator. And she actually learned about how to do interviews. She trained high school students how to do interviews. And then they went out and interviewed elders in the communities. And this is also on, you can see more details in the stories on our website, if you're interested. And then next slide. Um, this is a couple years ago, we had the participatory video actually in one of the videos and also some uh, Ghana youth, the blood tribe youth were also featured at the Cayman Basin. So it's just a picture of that in next slide. So on the horizon, next slide. <laughs> I won't spend too much, but we just wanted to let you know that through Brace, we have developed a collaboration and partnership with um, the Up North on Climate Team, who, uh, as David said, now Partnership for Indigenous Climate Change um, Action, PICA. We really are interested in how this partnership of convenience, um, how we might be able to help scale this up and out in communities that we work with so that we're broadening this to be a national scope. And um, we are now conducting whole community climate change vulnerability risk assessments with an eye on emergence, merging good practices that weave knowledge systems together. Um, we, we, had our, we have a, a visual storyteller who, who did this little graphic for us. And um, one of the things we're working on is the convergence of disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation with the Canadian Red Cross. This is not uh, public yet, but it, it's not a secret either. We have an MOU and we're developing an, a national scope of uh, programming. But but when you look at this, where, where does resilience sit in the context of adaptation? It's climate change, it's disaster risk reduction, and it's also how we're looking at asset management, built and natural. And we're often talking about these things separately and separate pools of funding. So how can we bring the conversation together? Um, and that's it. That's I'll just leave it at that. I know we're running a little bit over time, but really, um, thank you. Um, this was a privilege to be able to share with you today and to join Elvin in this this presentation. And thank you to to Brace for making this happen. Well, the people at Brace.
Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Alvin. That was a great presentation. Appreciate it. Just looking at questions here. There's none. So just a reminder, if you have any questions, just pop them in the Q&A box and we will address them after our last presentation. So our last presentation here, um, our final presenters are Christy Allen and Brett Hewson. Christy Allen is the research manager at the Prairie Climate Center at the University of Winnipeg. She manages the center's activities, which focus on evidence-based communication of the science impacts and risks of climate change through maps, documentary video, research reports, and plain language training, writing, and outreach. Brett Hewson is from the Gibson Nation of the Northwest Interior of British Columbia, Canada. He is a researcher at the Prairie Climate Center, focusing on braiding Indigenous knowledges with Western science for climate change adaptation. So I will give you the floor, Christy and Brett. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining in today. Um, it's really nice, David and Laura, for the presentations. It's nice to see some progress on some projects that we've sort of interfaced with in the past in various capacities. So um, today we're gonna focus on the brace work that we did in Manitoba here through the Manitoba Climate Resilience uh, Training Program. And we're gonna focus on some of the work that the PCC did. So I'll give you a brief overview of sort of the MCRT program and the PCC, and then Brett will go into some of the deep dive around the work. But what we were focusing on is weaving indigenous knowledges. So it's an overview of the indigenous knowledges and the two I'd seen courses that we had developed. Uh, Brett, do you wanna introduce yourself now or just wait till the end? Now you have to, cause I've called you out. So great. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm a so excited. Good afternoon. Um, my real name is Hetum Sket. My government name is Brett Hewson. I come from the Gitxan Nation in Northwest Interior, British Columbia, but I have been residing in Winnipeg now for almost 18 years. Um, and uh, a lot of my focus is on Indigenous sciences and a lot of what I write, uh, both for young people and a lot of the work that I do now focuses on that weaving of the knowledge systems. Cool. Next slide, please. So maybe just before we get started, we'll give a nice little land acknowledgement. So we're coming from Winnipeg here. We're at the University of Winnipeg, one of the internal research centers. So we're in Treaty 1 territory, the home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oje Cree, Dene, and Dakota people, um, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, our water that is filling my teacup right now comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in the Treaty 3 territory. And the electrical power that is generating my computer, which is allowing me to speak to you. Um, it comes from hydroelectric uh, infrastructures on Treaty 1, 3, and 5 territories. Um, and one fun little fact about Winnipeg this, this March is it's a climate fact, so everyone should be happy. This is the first time in 124 years for the entire month of March, we did not go above the temperature of zero. So if Brett and I seem a little bit bitter, this is probably why it's still cold. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a little bit of an overview of the Prairie Climate Center. So we're, we're a nice little center, small little team here. I think we've got about, usually range from about eight to 10 people, really diverse transdisciplinary people. Um, and we really work to make climate change meaningful, understandable, relatable, relevant. So work on that knowledge translation and dissemination side. Um, and what we do is we really try to weave together, intersect sort of different ways of knowing um, as we'll get to today and with some of the work that we've done, but we do this in a variety of ca capacities. So we have climatologists that really work on the side with climate data, adaptation specialists who work on helping communicate the process of adaptation planning, vulnerability and risk assessment. And then the, the funner people in the group are the, the filmmakers, they're, they're the really, really talented ones who kind of take all these stories and these localized knowledges and they, they bring them into an, an engaging fashion that people really want to want to engage with. Um, not to say that there's nothing wrong with graphs. Danny Blair, our director here would kill me, but um, the, we really work to sort of intersect that Western science with local knowledges, with indigenous knowledges as we'll get to today. Um, next slide, please. And one of the main ways that we do this, and I'm, I'm sure many people on the call have seen it. Um, if you haven't, you should go take a look is through the Climate Atlas of Canada, uh, which was launched in 2018. And what it is, is it's a interactive map. Well, there's a few other few elements, but the main piece that people generally tend to go to is an interactive map with climate data information for all of the country. So you can click in, you can find your location and you can see what your climate will look like in the projected future. Um, this is, kind of, is done through a number of variables. We all know we talk, sometimes the IPCC talks about climate change and sort of 
one degree of warming, two degrees of warming, what does that mean? We break it down into sort of understandable, understandable variables like increase in number of plus 30 days, which we can relate to, or heat waves, which is something I would like to relate to right now, but is not happening. So uh, given the weather outside, but, and so one of the things that happened alongside as we were running this, um, the MCRT program is we actually launched the Indigenous uh, Climate Atlas of Canada. So we released data for uh, processed and then uh, released on the map the data for all of the First Nations, Inuit, uh, and in Inuit communities in Canada, as well as there's a number of Métis projects that are featured. And this was done in collaboration with the Assembly of First Nations, uh, Métis National Council, and it was it was a huge launch. It was great. We did. We did that in March 2022. So it was a, a big notable update for the Atlas that kind of almost ended off all of our brace, uh, our training webinars. So go take a look. Uh, next slide. And so our project in particular was a part of the Manitoba Brace Project or the Manitoba Climate Training, uh, Climate Resilience Training Program. Uh, so this was a, a nice collaboration, I would say. It was there were four different sectors, um, as you can see on the screen, of which there was planning, northern business, infrastructure, and then the, the indigenous. Uh, we, we, we contemplate whether we call it a sector or, sector or not, but <laughs> it, it was one of the themes that was there. So, and this was all coordinated by ICLE, and there was 18 courses delivered um, publicly. The, really, the focus was on module uh, development and courses that were publicly available for everybody for free. Um, and so I think I think it was a great success and there was a lot of we met kind of monthly between all of these four sectors and there was a lot of intersection, which I think um, was really nice because we often work in climate adaptation in these nice silos and we realized that there actually is a lot of overlap between indigenous communities and infrastructure, oddly, because there's infrastructure everywhere and planning and indigenous communities and northern business. So it, it was really nice to connect with all of these groups as they were we were all working to develop um, courses that were different but had some some common themes that pulled through them so um next slide and so i think what brett is going to go through you with through with you ooh, talking today is fun um it's sort of the content that we developed throughout this process and the trainings that we delivered in the theme areas um we always try to put a simpsons meme into all of our presentations here just because so i like to think i'm the person running around in the background just with myself on fire and brett is working very diligently to <laughs> develop all this corporate so brett you can go and give give an overview please <laughs> that is 100 percent me uh in the chair uh, next slide please so Albert Marshall uh, defines two-eyed seeing as learning to see from one eye with the strengths in, in, of Indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of mainstream knowledges and ways of knowing, and to use both of these eyes uh, to go forward to benefit for all. So um, kind of what um, pushed me towards doing a lot of this work was seeing the way in which uh, research happens uh, within Indigenous communities. So typically, um, where I'm from, I can speak where I'm from, but I'm sure this is very relevant to a lot of uh, uh, Indigenous communities, both um, from the reserves to the urban setting. Um, researchers would come in with their questions. There are questions in English, there are questions with scientific, scientific terminologies, and they would say, do you know X, Y, and Z? And then they would determine, because we didn't understand the words, Oh, they don't know about X, Y, and Z, so we need to show them how to do something. So this is typically the approach that is taken with Indigenous communities. Uh, so what kind of bothered me with that is, you know, the 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 idea that we didn't understand the way the world works, but you can't have complex governance systems, civilizations, or peoples existing in one place for tens of thousands of years without having a very complex and innate understanding of ecosystems and how the world works around you. Uh, the first people to translate our languages where I'm from uh, were priests who didn't really understand the world in the way that we did at all. Uh, so a lot of times the terminology they would use for things that we were describing were religious terminologies and because they would say, okay, well, they can't really explain this to us, so let's just use this word. As an example, um, when we talk about spirit, they translated it to spirit. 
but the uh, the word it infers more about energy. It's just an energy in in the body that keeps the body running. Things like this. These are the things that were very frustrating to me. So I have always kind of tried to work towards looking at our knowledges in a very different way and helping to translate these knowledges. So what Albert Marshall kind of uh, focused on was to help people see that, you know, you really need to try to understand what Indigenous knowledges are to be able to utilize them in a good way in research. Uh, anything is peer reviewable. So the idea that you can't take any knowledge and put it into peer reviewable papers or research is kind of preposterous. So uh, they wanted to increase how many Indigenous people were participating at uh, the universities on the East Coast. So uh, him and his wife, Mardina, came up with this concept to try to increase the amount of students who were getting into the sciences, uh, the Western sciences at the university uh, in Cape Breton, I believe it was. Uh, next slide, please. So for us, uh, you know, connecting with Albert was incredibly important because it kind of became the, the spine of the background of the program that we were developing around Indigenous knowledges in that we wanted to approach this as more of how to build a relationship with Indigenous communities. How do you create something that's meaningful and reciprocal so that there's better roads and pathways to understanding with one another, rather than trying to figure out how can we tell them how to do this and then incorporate what they know about the land in this respect, but more so let's do this research together. Uh, so the first module that we developed was with Albert Marshall. It's just Indigenous Knowledges and Two-Eyed Seeing. And we had the very uh, good fortune to actually have Albert present with us in, in the module and uh, really kind of focus on helping connect Indigenous Knowledges to Western sciences, or I just say Indigenous sciences, um, uh, so that we can look at what climate change means within the Indigenous context. Uh, so we had, I, I heard a researcher once say they went to an indigenous community and said they don't know anything about climate change. Um, they might not know specifically about the data over the range, but when you're looking at adaptation and understanding of the impacts of climate change, there is a very deep understanding of what that is. Just because we aren't using certain terminologies doesn't mean we don't understand it. So that's kind of what we did with the first uh, module. And then the second module we got into was uh, indigenous mapping and climate change because we were utilizing uh, the climate atlas. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was the, the colonial aspect of a map. Using a map is a very political thing. It is a very impactful thing to indigenous communities. So we had a, a special guest with us at that pr presentation, uh, Steve DeRoy, who is a GIS specialist. And we wanted to talk about what indigenous mapping meant. How are we going to look at climate change through an indigenous lens and mapping and looking at the risks and how can we take those risks and assess them uh, on this type of scale. And again, it was really more so about how do we create these relationships around this kind of narrative. And then we moved into uh, climate change and in indigenous communities. And we had a, a guest speaker with us, uh, Leslie Spillett, who kind of came from the urban context because, you know, a lot of people forget there are a large urban population of indigenous communities um, across uh, Canada and very, very in particular here in, in Manitoba and Winnipeg. I think it's the largest urban indigenous population in Canada. So we kind of got this perspective on uh, what climate risks and impacts are, what they mean to Indigenous communities, and a discussion around uh, how they define uh, the climate change is defined across cultures. So this gave us an opportunity to kind of look at um, the, the perspectives we have on what climate change impacts are, because it's very different. Um, indigenous communities don't really sectorize uh, fields the way Western society does everything is connected for us. So health, um, industry, everything is all connected to climate adaptation and, and, and ecology and environment. So these are the things that we wanted to kind of show people. And in the, in the fourth module, we got into, you know, looking into the future. What will it mean to connect uh, adaptation knowledges and, and knowledges from, from the land to research now and kind of get what perspectives are uh, for the future of collaborations. And, and through this, we got to uh, have special guests who came from all different fields. They work in the Western context of academia, but also with closely to, to their indigenous knowledge systems. 
And so it was an opportunity for uh, participants and viewers who were both from Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities to actually take a look at how people are currently doing this right now. Uh, how are we looking at translating the knowledges? Next slide, please. So uh, when we take a look at uh, some of the uh, gaps and uh, challenges that we had, uh, it was typically that Indigenous knowledges were viewed primarily as primitive hunting and fishing knowledges. This is something that, you know, we typically came across when when uh, connecting to other communities as something that they expressed, uh, uh, other organizations that were non-Indigenous. Um, and then there's also a lot of projects across the country that weren't working to connect Indigenous knowledges into the mainstream, and they were mostly like one-off projects, um, you know, very different from what you're hearing about today. Uh, there are so many projects that, uh, you know, non-Indigenous companies will go for Indigenous funding, they'll hire one Indigenous person, they'll create this huge project, get all this money, and then they disappear. Um, and that's kind of typically the challenge that we are facing with a lot of Indigenous communities, they're not building long-term reciprocal relationships. Um, and then Indigenous communities are severely underfunded, and they lack resources, uh, and most of them are kind of looking at survival and most communities are not going to have the opportunity to actually say hey we need to worry about climate change because they just are worried about surviving um and th those are the some of the, the big challenges that we see uh, so one of the, the good uh, solutions and successes that we encountered over the, the course of the project is our modules uh, focused on work with indigenous knowledge keepers and sharing their perspectives uh, we developed dialogue around the methods of engagement to create meaningful reciprocal relationships between Western and Indigenous science. Uh, the knowledge keepers and experts came from all walks of life, and they also provided a narrative uh, of hope in a time of crisis. Uh, so, you know, a lot of Indigenous communities have been watching a severe change in their ecology for the past 200 to 400 years uh, with the introduction of newcomers. They completely changed the landscape, like it was, it's to something that we've never seen before. So we have been through this already. So it was really good to kind of look at how to incorporate our ability to adapt. And we're already adapting uh, to now where people are finally like facing their own adaptation dilemma. So mental health is playing into a lot of people people's lives now. Indigenous communities are already going through it. So I think there's an opportunity to really connect health-wise to Indigenous communities to see how we've coped with the already changing world. Next slide, please. So some of the takeaways we had throughout the project is that non-Indigenous organizations and communities benefit from these modules uh, as much as Indigenous communities did. Uh, bridging the gap between Western and Indigenous science will require more inclusive and meaningful connections. And hope needs to be the underlying message throughout any of the work within adaptation and resiliency. So we really need to focus on trying to use hopeful messages and to share uh, stories from people who carry a lot of hope with them. Next slide, please. So when it came to engagement and connection, participants had great experiences listening to elders. Uh, because a lot of communities never listened to elders in that respect before, and that's one of the things we found throughout this process. Uh, social media played a large part of connecting with an audience. Uh, the project allowed us to connect to other organizations and institutions that we are currently that are currently working towards a similar goals. Um, and also, it's been instrumental in youth and elder connections. So, uh, kind of reintroducing the idea to our people that uh, you connect with your elders is vitally important. Um, because a lot of urban centers don't have that connection anymore. Uh, these are the, some of the connections that, uh, you know, have been dismantled through residential schools and reservations and uh, urban uh, dilemmas, like such as poverty and, and you know, low income uh, lifestyles. Uh, so a lot of these things have disconnected the, the family connections. So um, really, really reestablishing those ideas is really important. It's something that was great that came out of this project. So all in all, it, it was amazing to kind of see the change uh, over the course of the project and then around the dialogue of what it means to actually look at Indigenous knowledges. Uh, and it's something that we're continuing to strive on with our work now. But uh, last slide, please. Thank you all for lending us your ears and eyes today. And uh, if you have any questions, just let us know.
like you only put my email address on there therefore i have to field <laughs> all the questions thank you brett i will pass you on to brett when you reach out to me <laughs> i i totally forgot to uh i just copied and pasted that slide <laughs> making more work for me okay thank you for listening everybody hope you're having a lovely day thank you christine brett that was very good very important wonderful presentation to finish off there for the rest of this so um thank you everyone for your presentations for all three of them uh we do have about 10 15 minutes left for a q a period if anyone has their questions please put them into the chat now um and if we don't get to, to them all today we will follow up with an email to make sure that it's answers so if uh, we could get all of our presenters to turn their cameras back on that would be great let's see you all there Perfect. So we do have a question, and this could be directed at any of the presenters. So if anyone wants to jump in, feel free, or I'll start picking on you. Um, but the question is, what is the best way to engage with Indigenous communities in our areas, and how to create a meaningful relationship? So does anyone want to take a crack um, at that one? I'll, I'll kind of... Uh pop in there a little bit. I think the, the the biggest thing is really kind of to look at who the Indigenous community is within your area. Like, are you from a rural area? Are you from an urban setting? Um, it can even be just looking through the academic institutions because a lot of them have a lot of great people connected to them. Uh, but also looking at uh, um, people who are working with the political organizations so the, the tribal councils or the larger provincial organizations, they are connected to a lot of uh, knowledge carriers. And then further to that, you know, if you want to connect with the uh, local community, try to get to friendship centers if you're an urban center, but also look to what reserves are located in, in the areas around the city, or if you're on a, a rural area, look at what uh, reserves or bands are nearby. Um, those are good places to kind of start, but usually you want to try to connect with leadership first or people who are in academic uh, institutions to just kind of connect with them and say, hey, you know, these are the kind of projects we're working on. And Google is a really great place now because a lot of the people are are starting to show up on Google searches. So if you're, for instance, look, working on infrastructure, there are a few indigenous infrastructure organizations that are out there. Uh, you can find them through Google. If you're working in uh, a field of architecture, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of Indigenous architects out there. Uh, medicine, there's a lot of Indigenous physicians, doctors, surgeons all over the place. Uh, there's a lot of people who work in environment. Uh, and then there's a lot of amazing people who are just uh, knowledge carriers from their communities. And those knowledges are just as in incredible and, and high level as one would expect from academia. Uh, it's just a a matter of translation again that's where you start to build a relationship and you work on uh that translation of what those knowledges are because sometimes even within indigenous communities the, the communities themselves sometimes uh will carry the stories but they've lost the the uh the the truths of the knowledge that go behind it as an example i can share for my nation i, I can't speak for any other nation but uh i'm originally Gitsan, so one of the stories we carry is about Tsibasa. So Tibasa is a one-horned mountain goat. And in the story, uh, the, the very brief of the story is that Tibasa, the great one-horned mountain goat, flicked pieces of the mountain onto the people uh, to uh, because they were mistreating the land and they were, they were mistreating the goat, mountain goat, and overusing resources. Uh, so what that represents was in the past uh, and during the, the establishment of our city, Dem Lahamid, there was a landslide that wiped out the city. And when it wiped out the city, that landslide dispersed the people and they moved to other places. They left the urban center. So that uh, that moment, that landslide about 13,000 years ago was commemorated through the chief Tibasa. So there's a chief who carries that name now, Tibasa, and they carry that truth behind that story. So the story, um, when you hear it, it's very mythical, you know, like the one horn mountain, go flicking mountain out of the people. But when you actually look at what the, the story means, it represents that landslide. Because people remember the great stories that are connected to chiefs. Uh, and chiefs is another thing that is different perspective Western to Indigenous. 
Um, anyway, the people remember that more than they'll say, remember, hey, there was a landslide 13,000 years ago. People will forget that if it's not written down. So we immortalize those in our stories and our songs uh, because it's something that can last for thousands, tens of thousands of years when you constantly have festivals regularly, have giant uh, uh, feasts, we call them. And those feasts where everyone would share these stories over and over and over and over. So they'd be stuck in time and memory. So again, that's just uh, one perspective, but there's many other nations who have their own stories and their own truths behind them. Can, uh, can I just add a, a, a quite different um, approach? I think that it's very important that um, people read the recommendations in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I do think that it's important uh, to understand the, um, the, what you might call a cultural background to uh, the, um, the effects of uh, colonization in, uh, in the country. Um, I, I, I really do think that, um, that until one understands the impacts of colonization, it's very difficult to, to build a, a, a solid and, and long-lasting relationship with, um, with First Nations. It's, it's taken us in our group more than 10 years to really become uh, confident that um, we uh, we understand the background of the the, uh, the people that we're we're working with. Uh, yeah. Oh, can I add uh, just something quick? Um, yeah, just um, research the nation that you're going to approach. Uh, don't paint us all with the one brush. Um, and don't try to utilize that pan uh, Canadian approach where you're you're considering us all as one group. We're all different. Even in the Blackfoot Confederacy, we do have four nations, but there are some differences within each nation, uh, dialect and uh, certain stories. So just be cautious of how you're approaching um, the nations, and then. Uh, try to follow proper protocols with each respective nation, whether that's gifting tobacco and um, utilizing them. And then uh, we, we, we try to align um, traditional ecological knowledge and Western science. We don't try to braid them, but we will set them side by side and utilize both. Um, because then that just takes away from traditional ecological knowledge. And um, we, we, we try not to uh, hold one higher than the other and making sure that uh, our knowledge holders are paid properly. Um, they're utilizing their time and uh, making sure that they, if they're speaking at a conference that they're, they're compensated just as much as a doctor would be. So um, that's just some little bit of um, things that you could follow. And I'll just uh, add one more perspective from a non-Indigenous person, but who has been an ally in working with Indigenous communities. That um, for, for me and for us, because I'm leading the organization, so it becomes an us, that we have been invited in for a conversation. And, and that might be somebody knows about our work or um, there's some kind of linkage. So there's an invitation to have a conversation and we start with a conversation and, and then we talk about, well, do we have something to offer? Is there something we can offer? with our ways of knowing or our um, subject matter experts, or if there's something, then what do we do next? And then that leads to a next conversation. And we continue this dance together until um, we don't need to, or we don't want to, or whatever the reason why. But it, it really is about, and like Alvin said, working with each community, because even though there are, um, respectful ways and there's things that can be learned about um, maybe some some protocol each community is different and really honoring that is so important 
Yeah, that's that's a huge thing, uh, Alvin. Especially talking about the differences in in, in communities. The pan-indigeneity is a huge thing as well that we battle constantly. Like the, the giving of tobacco, it doesn't exist where I'm from. I do that here because it's where it was like here where I'm from. But giving tobacco isn't a thing in, in my nation. We didn't do that. Uh, but every nation has different protocols, and that's pretty key to uh, to acknowledge as well as kind of those huge differences from nation to nation. Languages are very different. Uh, they're completely different nations. I mean, you look at the size of the lands in the Americas. There are many nations. There used to be millions of people here before we encountered our, our pandemics. When the first contact came, we most of, there were a lot of people who were extinct from diseases that came over because we didn't get sick like that before. So there's um, a huge kind of disconnect now but there were a lot a lot more nations than there are now even though there's still a lot of nations there were a lot more before everybody's insights are significantly better than mine so i'll add one that's a little bit lighthearted, but learn to drink a lot of coffee and tea and just sit around and chit chat which was my favorite job of working with david in particular in grand council treaty three it's you're just building relationships is building relationships but coffee and tea, and it depends where you are, but Bannock, Bannock tacos are also great. Yeah. That's, cool. That's all great information. Thank you all for your inputs there. I think we do have time for one question. We just had one come in. So um, it talked about how all of these projects had, they were successful because there was a community champion or someone from an indigenous community who was able to participate in the project um, so they're wondering if you have any suggestions about how to find these people, how to create create a space for these people when small communities are already so busy and already have wear so many hats, how to find someone who can contribute and has, has the capacity to do so. I'll start with this because this was a big thing with ours actually and an error I feel in that we did not come out of the gate with adequate funding um, designated to each of the communities and in part because we weren't sure which communities and there was some and there was different again agencies working so um but lesson learned from that and from other initiatives um that in every project whether it's a research project or some other kind if you're going out and you're looking for funding and you're going to collaborate i would strongly recommend that you include um, at least a part-time funding for at least a part-time position and not assume that people who are working should just add it on to their already busy jobs. Ima imagine saying, we want to do this adaptation project with you, somebody coming to you and saying, we want to do this, this is really important. Um, so drop half of what you're doing already, that's really important, and start working on this. It just there should be there should be salary recovery or a hiring a whole new person plus training, um, and I know Dave's going to agree with this. Like this is absolutely, and we talk about building capacity and strengthening communities. And if you want to do that, really make sure that you have adequate budget to pay people the same kind of value that you would pay somebody within your own organization or with it, if it's in a university, whatever it is, on par um not just an honorarium for showing up and for you know expecting to do some work so that's my my point on that quite passionately is that it is essential to for many reasons um you know not not just not just to get the work done but also this is part of reconciliation really um that's it okay thanks <laughs> Yeah, uh, payment is huge. It's it's absolutely massive. It, you know, um, oh man, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me to work on something for exposure. I'm beyond exposure. I'm beyond uh, anything of that sort. I never do anything for free myself anymore. I've just gotten to a point where I've been asked too many times. Um, that being said, my own communities who are underfunded, I do things uh, pro bono for my communities. Um, I do things for them um, with payment of fish or honorarium that whatever they have to offer. Um, but anywhere else, I do not do things for free. 
I will never expect to do anything for free anymore. And that's the kind of mentality I think people have to, again, approach when they want to work with other people. Um, because I've been in so many projects where a lot of what I gave to those people, they were making much more than I was. I was just getting paid part-time work for a lot of ideas that they then used and utilized um, and made a, a crap ton of money out of it. Uh, so that's a big thing too. Again, uh, yeah, just reiterating that, like, uh, you know, small honorariums don't even fill a gas uh, a tank of gas anymore in any vehicle. Uh, so you have to really kind of consider those things uh, when trying to find someone who can help work with you uh, to contribute to your project and to champion your project. Uh, I'd just like to add, um, you should be trying to co-develop your projects and not go in there with uh, a project that's already designed to meet your narrative. Actually go in there and ask the nations, like what are, what are they working on and how could you collaborate and figure out a way to align your, your messages so that uh, it's not a burden on the nation and that you can continually build that relationship with them instead of looking at ways to fill your your cup look at ways to help help the other nation and uh yeah just again yeah make sure that uh they they have that capacity if not how how could you help them fill that capacity um by creating that employment because employment creation is key most most uh reserves have like 80 percent unemployment rates and if we could create jobs that's that's huge in in the world but yeah thanks all right any last comments before we wrap it up here we all good excellent thank you so much for your input everyone so um just to finish up here i think that's about it uh, we'll include uh, some reference slides at the end here that have, um, there's a survey evaluation form if you get a chance to fill that in. We'll also include the link in the chat and it'll be including the copy of the slides that you will all receive post-webinar. Um, we welcome any comments that will help us with any upcoming webinars we have, but I think that's it on my end. So thank you very much to our presenters and thank you to everyone who came and watched today. Have a great day. <laughs>